Okay, now we begin uh, lecture four of the course NE402, Intermediate Nuclear Engineering, which uh, is essentially a course on neutron diffusion and neutron transport, as well as an extension to radiation transport and diffusion uh, and Monte Carlo simulation. So this is a kind of unified approach. And in the last three lectures, I have gone through uh, uh, nuclear radiation, neutron flux, radiation flux, current, nuclear data, reaction rates, and uh, this is chap uh, this is lecture four. Uh, it's still on the first chapter, introduction to nuclear engineering, and I'm taking you through uh, the book, through my book, and uh, the, all the notes are over there. So this is a kind of uh, going through the book uh, with explanations. You don't just have to read it. So there's a whole uh, understanding of this in lecture four. Now this lecture, today's uh, fourth lecture is on neutrons slowing down. How do neutrons collide? How do they interact in matter? Uh, and what kind of reactions take place? Uh, I'll define lethargy, uh, collision density, slowing down density. Uh, we will look at uh, uh, an equation derived by Enrico Fermi. It's called the Fermi age equation. And we'll see what does uh, the Fermi age equation uh, mean physically. Uh, and then we will use this to uh, go through neutron diffusion in one and two groups. Uh, as in the previous lectures, I said uh, that my email is here, my personal email, my official email, uh, and my uh, cell number. Uh, that's my name over here. Uh, so let me begin the lecture. Okay, so what do we mean by neutrons slowing down? Now, what happens is that neutrons are born at a high energy, either as source neutrons, as we saw in the first uh, three lectures, uh, or uh, they're produced in some reactions. And uh, typically, they start with some high energy. They start at a source energy, E0 and they collide. So if you fire neutrons at any uh, material such as uh, graphite, steel, so what it does is that it collides with the atoms of that material and a neutron loses energy. We also define a term called the lethargy. Now, when you talk of a person who's lethargic, that means the person is a bit slow, uh, lazy. So this is the laziness of uh, uh, neutrons. So as they lose energy, they, became, they become more uh, lethargic, they become lazier. So we define U as the natural log of E naught over E. Now that is because there are lots of collisions once they come down to what is called thermal energy because then they can take and give energy as they settle into equilibrium with the surroundings. The easiest two reactions to understand when you talk of collisions are elastic collisions and inelastic collisions. So if a neutron scatters off a, a host nucleus, it can either uh, scatter off in an elastic manner in which energy is conserved or in an inelastic manner where some energy is lost, lost by uh, friction, for example. Uh, the threshold of inelastic reactions for low mass nuclei is very high. Uh, so the energy lost by inelastic scattering is mainly from heavy nuclei, such as U238. <clears throat> the fractional energy loss of neutrons with li light nuclei can be very high, and we'll look at uh, alpha later on in this lecture. So a neutron colliding with a light nucleus such as hydrogen can lose all of its energy in a single collision. While uh, only a small fraction of its energy can be lost if it collides with heavy nuclei such as uranium. So if you were to look at the neutron spectrum, so now this is a picture over here of the neutron spectra, uh, which means the, uh, the energy distribution of neutrons uh, in thermal and fast reactors. So in the previous lecture, I discussed what a thermal neutron was, like a light, what a thermal reactor was, like a light water reactor, and what a fast reactor was. So if you look at this figure over here, so this plots the neutron flux and remember, neutron flux has units of neutrons per centimeter square per second. So it plots the 
<coughs> neutron flux versus the neutron energy. Now let's look at a typical thermal reactor which has this kind of a neutron spectrum. So you can see that there's a little peak over here and these are thermal energies. So these are low energies. So there's a lot of population at low energy. There's a fairly good amount of population at near fission energies and there's something in between. So broadly speaking, we uh, classify these three regions of neutron spectrum in a reactor as the fast spectrum, the epithermal spectrum, and the thermal spectrum. Now this uh, is a typical uh, neutron flux in a light water reactor. By light water, pressurized water reactor, boiling water reactor. And this other, the second curve shows that there's almost nothing at very low energies, which means that neutrons have not been allowed to lose a lot of energy in collisions. And this is a fast spectrum, which appears in reactors such as fast breeder reactors. So neutrons born at high energies are not allowed to slow down to thermal energies, which means that you don't have a hydrogenous material. So that's what it says here in fast reactors, for example, the spectrum is hard. Okay, now these are words that we use hard and soft. So hard spectrum is something like this, hard meaning that it's at high energies. And uh, while in thermal reactors, it is soft. So just like we use the words fast and thermal, so we use hard and soft for the spectrum, the energy distribution. Now, since the fission cross-section is low at high energies, you saw last time, that the fission cross-section of U235 is about is over 500 barns at low energy, while it's very low at high energies. So it is natural that fast reactors will have a higher flux, will need a higher flux to maintain reactor power. So as this figure shows, uh, the values of thermal flux in thermal and fast reactors will be like 10 to the 12 and 10 to the 15 neutrons per centimeter square per second. Now let's come to collisions. So let's look at scattering. Now, here's the terminology that neutrons are scattering with target nuclei. So you fire neutrons on a target nucleus and it's a complicated phenomenon, theoretically and experimentally. The modeling is not that straightforward. <coughs> now the scattering cross section, which you saw in the previous lecture, has a smooth variation at low energies, like the absorption cross-section, but extends to somewhat higher energies. Then it exhibits broad resonances and then smoothens off. At low energies, neutrons exhibit what is called S-wave scattering for light as well as heavy nuclei, which is predominantly isotropic in the center of mass system. I'm just going to show you a center of mass system. So we talk about a lab system and we talk about a center of mass system. We operate in a lab system. You throw a stone on the wall, it comes back to you. So that's the lab. The lab is that you throw a stone on, on something like a wall. If it's a tiny stone, of course, it's not going to break the wall. It's going to come back. So you can do the analysis by modeling it the way it is, or you can define a new system called the center of mass system. So at higher energies and for larger nuclear, nuclear radii, the scattering is P-wave scattering, which is forward biased rather than isotropic. And I'm just going to take you through forward biased, backward biased, and isotropic. Now, isotropic is a word that you can imagine uh, a candle. Now, when you have a candle burning in the room, then it's, it's, it uh, gives light in all directions. So no particular direction is more important than the other. So if you're sitting in front of it, so there's no front of a candle or back of a candle. Whereas if you have an anisotropic source, like a torch, so there's more light in front of the torch than behind the torch. So that is not an isotropic source. A torch would be called an anisotropic source. It's a forward scattering source. So a neutron scattering of a U238 heavy nucleus is bound to be forward biased. That is, it favors forward scattering rather than higher angles of scattering. Light nuclei with a higher threshold for inelastic 
reactions are more likely to undergo elastic collisions at low energies, while heavy nuclei will mainly undergo inelastic scattering. So look at these pictures over here. So this is the lab system. This is the center of mass system. Now I've shown this as a black dot, the neutron, and this is some big nucleus like U238, like carbon 12. <coughs> so here comes the neutron with a speed small v in the lab system VL. It goes and hits the nucleus in the lab system, which you can say has a speed of capital VL. If it's at rest, then capital VL is zero. So it bounces off, it scatters into a new energy VL prime, and the nucleus recoils with speed VL prime. The, the scattering angle of the neutron with respect to the horizontal axis in this case is theta L. Now, so together with this system, let's consider another system called the center of mass system, the CM system. The CM system, which will be considered for not only mathematical simplicity, but for using, it will be used for another property of scattering called isotropic scattering. In the center of mass system, the barycenter of the masses has a velocity Vc, okay? <coughs> with velocity Vc, and it scatters by an angle theta c. So theta c is this for this at the center. And so if this is at rest, you can imagine it's approaching the center with the negative speed over here. This is going here minus the speed of the center. So we can write down the laws of, we can write down the momentum equations and the uh, the continuity the momentum has two equations the vector equation we can also write the conservation of energy equation and we can connect the two systems and that's what i'm just going to show so energy conservation a neutron coming with energy e small n in the lab system has to give all its energy to the target nucleus which goes into e prime for a target nu nucleus of relative mass A, and the mass of the neutron after scattering E and L prime. Of course, there's no term over here, which means there's nothing lost by friction. Now let's uh, look at the horizontal and vertical momentum. We, then we'll get a relationship between the final energy of a neutron E prime and its initial energy E. So you put them all together and you can get this relationship between the energy after the collision, the energy before the collision, and the scattering angle theta, and the relative mass A, which is capital M divided by small m. Capital M mass of the target nucleus, small m the mass of the neutron. If you connect this to the angle in the center of mass system, then you get this relationship, which is used a lot and I'm really going to use this a lot, so let's look at this. So these are the two energies in the lab system. And this is the alpha, which is defined like this. So if you're talking about hydrogen, hydrogen has an A of one, so alpha would be zero. So hydro for hydrogen, this alpha would be zero, so it's just one plus cosine theta, okay? And for uh, U235, this would be two, oh, sorry, for U238, this would be 237 divided by 239 whole square. It's about 0.9 something. So meaning that a very small amount of energy can be lost by the neutron. So this is the relationship between energy after a collision and energy before the collision in the lab system. Now let's look at some forms of that. So here's a form. You can see that when the angle is zero above, then the energy is after the collision, it's maximum, which means forward scattering. And when it's backward scattering, then the energy of the neutron after the collision, collision is the minimum possible, which is alpha E and L. So for hydrogen, as I told you, for A is equal to one, alpha is zero. So if you put alpha is equal to zero, so the minimum energy comes out to be zero. So any neutron with some initial energy E and L prime can go down to an energy of zero. So all the energy can be lost by a neutron in a single collision. While for a heavy nucleus such as U238, alpha is 0.98, so it's 237 divided by 
239 whole square, 0 0.9833. <clears throat> and a neutron can lose just a small amount of energy since its minimum energy after collision is this much. So a 1 MeV neutron striking a U238 nucleus will have an energy between 0.9833 and, point, and, and 1 MeV. So actually a very small, so like you can say that 0 0.02 MeV is lost to the recoil nucleus. Okay, almost about 0 0.02 MeV. Now the energy in the lab system after a collision of a neutron with nuclei of hydrogen, carbon, iron, U238 is shown over here. Let's look at it. So on the y-axis, vertical axis is the energy of the neutron after the collision. Let's say it starts with an energy of 1 MeV. And let's look at the case of hydrogen. Now hydrogen, and this is the scattering uh, angle in the center of mass system. And I plotted this between zero and 180 degrees, zero and pi radians. So if you look at the scattering with hydrogen, what do you see over here? You see that at low energies, so the energy is, uh, comes down very slowly. At high energies, the energy after collision drops to zero. So a, a, a neutron uh, striking a hydrogen nucleus can come down to zero energy. Now, the opposite case is a heavy thing like U238, which is the top light blue curve over here. You see it just starts from one and goes to 0.98 something. So the neutron remains at a high energy and these are the intermediate cases. Okay, so these are the relationships between the velocity at the, uh, of the center of the mass and the velocity in the lab system. The speed of the neutron and nucleus in the center of mass system is related to the speeds in the lab system like that. Now here's the vector diagram which shows that here's the lab angle, here's the CM angle, and this is how they're related through the conservation of momentum and energy. <clears throat> okay, now again we can use the vector diagram over here to get uh, the cosine theta from the triangle and uh, there's a little exercise for you, you should try this yourself. So what I've said in exercise 1.3 is that given the direction cosines for these 2D vectors A and B, we are given the direction cosines of uh, of these two vector. No, sorry. This is for another case where you are given for this case we are given the direction cosines uh, like this. Calculate the angle between the two vectors. Okay, there's an answer. There's a little exercise for you from vector algebra. Now let's return to something really interesting. That what is the probability that a neutron comes down? from some high energy E to some final energy E prime. Well, the probability, uh, now whether you work in terms of the final energy as a variable or the final angle as a variable, it's just the same thing. Uh, you have to connect them. So let's say that P E to E prime D E prime in words is the probability that a neutron scatters from some initial energy E to some final energy E prime, which lies in an interval D E prime. So this is the ratio of the differential scattering cross section, meaning as a function of angle times the solid angle. Now the solid angle is omega. Omega is the solid angle of the football of the earth. So it's made up of two angles, theta and phi. Okay. So basically here, I should also have a phi over here. Okay, so uh, solid angle is made up of theta and phi. If you divide that by the angle integrated scattering differential cross section, then this is the probability which is equivalent to this. Now in uh, spherical geometry, d omega, a small d omega is uh, d mu d phi where mu is cosine theta. So this is sine theta d theta d phi. And if you say that you have azimuthal symmetry, the azimuthal angle is the base angle. So if you integrate the base angle, it goes from zero to two pi and leave the thetas over there. So mu remember is cosine 
theta. So you can get a relationship between E prime and theta. <clears throat> now let me take you back. Uh, you might have forgotten now that we got this relationship, which I told you is going to be very useful later on. And so now I have a relationship for the probability of a neutron scattering from here to there. And this is it. So if you look here, this is the E prime, the final energy, and this is the theta. So now I'm going to use this relationship in the probability uh, equivalence between the two variables, E prime and theta. Okay, so I'm going to use that equation over here. And if I have what is called isotropic scattering, so which means that, uh, that it's uh, isotropic in the center of mass system, so no angle is, uh, is, uh, has, has preference over the other. So then uh, sigma s uh, theta becomes sigma s over 4 pi. Okay, it's the same everywhere. So then you get sigma s over 4 pi over here. So the two sigma s's cancel out. 2 pi over 4 pi leaves you with a factor of 2. And you've got d mu. Now I told you that mu is cosine of theta. So this uh, d mu becomes minus sine theta d theta. So here's your relationship. Now what do we do with this? So uh, if you say, if you, uh, so if you look at this over here, so uh, the relationship between so you can get de prime by d theta from the relationship above and you get this over here because you had a cosine theta. So the relationship, so de prime d theta prime gives you sine theta that cancels out and you're left with this thing. Now let's look at this, uh, this relationship. Over here. It says that the probability that a neutron scatters from an initial energy E to a final energy E prime is one over E times one minus alpha. There's no E prime over here. So it's just dependent on the initial energy and of course the mass ratio of the scattering angle. Now here's a picture to show you something better. So let's, let me look at this blue line. Now this is my art. So it's just, uh, uh, I drew this myself on a paper, took a picture, transferred it to this file. So this blue line, is in terms of energy. So it goes upward. So it starts from energy zero and goes to some maximum energy E naught. These are two energy intervals DE1 and DE2. Now I told you that lethargy is the opposite of energy. So energetic source neutron has zero lethargy. It's not at all lethargic. And U increases downward. So as the energy becomes smaller, U becomes larger. E becomes smaller as the energy decreases, but U becomes larger. Now let's look again, what does that say? That says over here that the probability of scattering from a high energy to a low energy just depends on E. So if you come down from E2 to E1, so it doesn't depend on E1, it depends only on E2 and of course on alpha. So let's uh, try to develop this further, let's consider uh, an infinite medium of hydrogen. Now, why hydrogen? Because I would like to put alpha equal to zero and try to see if I can get something which can teach me something. We're trying to understand nature. So whenever you try to understand nature, make it as simple as possible and make a lot of assumptions. Try to obtain something. Try to look for a trend. Try to make something like a Newton's law of motion. He didn't look at friction. You can put all those terms later but try to look at the simplest possible picture. And that's why we look at hydrogen, infinite medium, infinite, it extends to everywhere, uniform, distributed source, emitting S neutrons per cubic centimeter per second at one energy. And let's say it's a mono energetic source, energy E naught. So you see how many assumptions we've made over here. We are going to assume that there's no absorption in hydrogen. Okay, such a simple picture. So let's write, the, what we wrote for the probability. So the one minus alpha is gone from the denominator because one minus zero is one. And the initial energy I'm going to call E naught, this one, it starts as a source neutron. And I'm interested in the probability that it comes down to this E and inside DE. 
So the probability is DE divided by E naught. Now I want you to put some numbers in here. So I want you to answer these two self-assessment exercises. What is the probability that a neutron at an initial energy of one MeV would scatter in hydrogen and would have its final energy between 0.5 and 1 MeV. So use this for hydrogen and get the answer. The second self-assessment exercise is consider the forward and the backward scattering cases for the differential scattering cross-section I showed you above. Assume linear forms and sketch the probability. Remember, sketch everything. Just take a paper and a pen and sketch what P should look like. Do you think it should be straight? Do you think it should be going up or down? And just try to reason with yourself. <clears throat> okay, so with that simple model of hydrogen, infinite medium, monoenergetic source, no absorption, let's try to find the flux. Now, note here that I've said phi is just a function of E. There's no, there's no space over here. Why? Because it's an infinite medium. So let's now try to find the flux. Flux is what? It's the population per neutron per centimeter square per second, the population of neutrons. So let's try to find the energy dependent flux. Let's assume it's independent of position because it's an infinite medium. The number of collisions at some energy, let's say it's sigma t times phi e. Phi is neutrons per centimeter square per second. Macroscopic cross section is one over a centimeter. So this becomes total cross total interactions per cubic centimeter per second per MeV multiplied by MeV. If you had the volume of the region, you just multiply by the volume to get the total number of interactions per second. Now let's try to write this down for some DE. So what do you think it should be? Well. If you look at it in the simplest possible sense, it should be the sum of a direct contribution from the source and an indirect contribution from collisions taking place somewhere else and reaching this. Now that should hopefully give us an integral equation. So let's look at this picture. Look at this picture. Now, when you look at this picture, here's the source energy, here's a lower energy. So what I've asked you was that let's try to obtain the collision density F as a function of, actually this should be as a function of E, DE, because this is E prime. So, so I've got a mistake here. So this is F of E, DE. Now the, the number of collisions taking place in here, I just told you, are due to two things. A direct contribution, a source neutron, which was born here and it jumps into here directly. It didn't see anything in between. The others are those that come from somewhere else. So let's look at another region, DE prime. So there's another collision density here. This should be FE prime, DE prime. And what's the probability that it has an interaction here and jumps directly into here? So I know this probability. So let's try to use it. Remember it was PE prime going to E is one over E prime times DE. So that's what I just did. So let's write down those two terms. Now the probability of a direct contribution is a source neutron S falling into DE starting at E naught. So this is the collision density FE DE. So this is the first term that you see over here is the direct contribution. Now the second term that you see, let's look at this longish thing. So it's something taking place inside here. And once it's taken place, let's say there are 3,000 uh, collisions that have taken place over there. Uh, how many of those 3,000 were to come here? So I'd multiply it by the probability that this initial energy E prime would take it to the final energy E. I would integrate over the initial energies and I would let the initial energies go from this E right up to E naught. Now, if this was not hydrogen, then I could not say that it goes from E to E naught. I would have to say it goes from E to the upper bound, which is E over alpha, because it can't come from something above that. So here's my indirect contribution. The collision term taking place here, multiplied by the probability over here, and 
DE is a constant, I take it out. And the PE prime to E is DE over E prime. So see, that's simpler. And let's call this thing sigma T E prime phi E prime. Let's call it the collision density. Let's give it the name capital F. And right now, just like flux was not a function of position, so collision density is also not going to be a function of position. Why? Because it's an infinite loop. <clears throat> so let's write a balance equation. Now, what kind of an equation is this? It's got an integral term. So let me call it an integral equation. So here's the collision density in the area I'm interested in. And I said it's made up of two things, a direct plus an indirect contribution. Okay, when you write an equation, that's half the story. How do you solve it? If you write an equation and you can't solve it, that's what Boltzmann did, and we're going to see that in the transport equation, it leaves you terribly frustrated. So, but the first step is to formulate something. So we made a picture in our mind. This is a little picture I made in your mind. I hope you've made it too. Uh, so this is a picture I carry with me. And this is the equation. What do I do with it? Well, I try to solve it. And I notice here that it can be easily solved just by differentiating it. Because there's a nice little integrand over here. And, you know, we were taught in, in uh, A-levels that integral is an integration is the opposite of a differentiation. So let me differentiate f with respect to e. So this is a constant, it disappears, just goes to zero. And because the lower term here has got an e, the upper doesn't, so it's a negative sign. And I just evaluate the integrand at the lower limit, so it becomes like this. Now look at this. Can you do anything with this? Yes, it's separable. So, so I remember when I was in A-levels, uh, Mr. Saidi, Ramana High School taught us, and he always used to say, Zafar, if you can get a separable form that's so easy, you put things on the left-hand side separately and right-hand side separately. So here it is. So there's an F here, an F here. I take it down. So DF over F is minus DE over E. I integrate both of them. I get a log F here, a negative log E over here. So I get an inverse relationship between F and E. So F is some constant divided by E. If I say this is E naught, then F of E naught is S. Uh, so I can get F going as S over E. Well, I'm more interested in the shape of the flux. And here it is, that if, this, if the total cross-section is not energy dependent, then we get a one over E flux. Now this is a term you'll see a lot in nuclear engineering. Everybody will say, there's a one over E dependence. In the thermal region, there's a one over E dependence. Now you can close your eyes and say there's a one over E dependence. What does that mean? That means that in the lower end of the spectrum, and let me take you back there, in the lower end, the curves that I showed you there, the flux come down, comes down as one over E. Okay, now let me introduce another term, sorry, let me introduce another term to you. Called the collision density. Uh, sorry, the, the slowing down density. So first I spoke to you of a collision density. Now where do collisions take place? In a room, in a volume. And when I talk to you about a slowing down density, where, where does something slow down? Well, if you make a gate and it crosses that gate, then it slows down. So collision density is something which depends on volume and slowing down density is something which depends on a door or window. So let's look at a picture of it. So I had a picture somewhere over here, which I don't think I... Okay, so I didn't bring it in here, but I had a picture which I wanted to show you that what's the difference between S and F? It's not even on the previous page. Okay. So what's the difference between F and Q? 
Well, it's the same difference as between phi and j. So when I did that, I told you that phi is flux. It has to be inside a medium. And I told you that current has a boundary crossing. It should be across a wall. The same thing. So look at this line E. Anything which slows down past E is going to be counted as a slowing down neutron. And I'm going to count it. Something which comes and stops over here, I'm not going to say it's part of QE. <clears throat> so F of E needs a volume and Q of E is defined as the average number of neutrons falling below energy E is called the slowing down density. Now Enrico Fermi, an outstanding scientist, engineer, uh, did a lot with the slowing down density. And I'm going to show you uh, in the next lecture. Because that opens a new, uh, new world, a new a, a window to a new world. This is a window to a new world uh, for uh, neutron diffusion, for the diffusion equation, and uh, which we're going to do in the next chapter. So, so right now, collision density and slowing down density. Now, look at this over here. You see these discontinuities. Now, these discontinuities. If you look at this case, now I, I told you about. So the collision density for hydrogen in an infinite medium, well, everything has got to slow down. So obviously, QE has got to be S, so I can use the same arguments as before, and you can do this for yourself. I think you should do it yourself because uh, we've got to clear concepts at this stage. Now, everything is not hydrogen in the world. There are things for which A is greater than one. So let's look at the case of A greater than one. Now, A greater than one is carbon, it's um, uranium, it's everything in the periodic table other than hydrogen. So the entire energy domain is not available for a neutron. So a neutron at energy E cannot go be below alpha E. Remember when we did scattering, I told you that's the minimum it can go down to. So we get, so Placek did this, uh, and uh, there's a lot of work of the 60s and 70s on this. So if you look at the collision density versus the uh, the one, two, three, four are the lethargy per unit interval and the E's, see, E naught, the source energy to alpha E to alpha square E to alpha cube E naught, et cetera, et cetera. So, these are, so, so for A is equal to infinity, a very high nucleus, uh, a collision density starting from zero can go up to some value here. But this cannot cross into that domain, so there's a discontinuity. So for the red is for the very heavy nuclei. The blue, you can see there are less discontinuities. This is for A equal to 2. These are called the Placiak wig wiggles. Now, how do we do a theory for them? It must be difficult because they're discontinuities. So when discontinuities appear only near the source, then in the asymptotic energy region, we can get a solution. Okay, asymptotic means somewhere here, we can get a solution <clears throat> far from the source. And we get, again, something like 1 over E. And there's a little psi over here, or a squiggle. And you can show that phi is 1 over E again, but there's a number over here. And that number is the average value of delta U, which I'll call the average change in lethargy per collision. So you know the probability of a neutron going from E to E prime is that. So the average change in the lethargy during a collision can be the change in lethargy averaged over the collision going from alpha E to E. So if E was the uh, initial energy, so alpha E can be the final energy. So we integrate this over the final energy. <clears throat> And if you carry out that integral, we get something which again we use a lot that the average logarithm, average uh, lethargy change per collision is this term, which simplifies to this for high A. So, what have we learned from here? That for neutrons colliding in hydrogen, the uh, change in lethargy can be maximum because energy can go down to zero. Now, by similar arguments, you can show the the uh, slowing down density QE comes down again 
the same way here it was the source. So again here it's the source. The total slowing down fast and energy is S in the asymptotic region. And we can extend this to the case of non-mono energetic neutrons, uh, neutron source. Uh, you can show that the same result appears for hydrogen as we obtained for the mono energetic source that we considered here. Uh, for mixtures, again, a si similar dependence is found, except that properties are averaged over the elements of the mixture. Okay, so I think I should stop over here because the next section is, is, uh, is something in its own right, uh, although it carries uh, this line of reasoning ahead. So I hope right now what you've done is you made a picture in your mind of neutrons slowing down. So just wait for the next lecture, and then I'm going to show you something fascinating, something that Enrico Fermi left us with. It's called the Fermi age equation. The Fermi age equation explains slowing down so beautifully that you're going to understand what uh, neutron slowing down is, you're going to understand what neutron diffusion is, and these are the foundations of our understanding of nuclear engineering. So let me uh, stop over here and uh, see you again in lecture number five. Thank you.